Wow. Grizzlies off to a really quick three and one start to this NBA season. One of the best records in the league so far. John Morant is scoring at an insane pace. Hello, Desmond Bain. Welcome back. 38 point game for him. Santi Aldama, big surprise. So, guess what? We're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about the big surprises so far and just some early season takeaways good, the bad, and the best stuff coming up right here, right now on Locked On Grizzlies. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you can get your podcasts. Literally any podcast availability out there, you can find Locked On Grizzlies also on YouTube. We've had a couple of very strong days on YouTube. Thank you so much to everyone that has started to uh, make the trip over to the YouTube channel. Hopefully uh, my ugly mug isn't distracting you too much. DeMichael is much more handsome than me. So that certainly helps things in that way. Uh, But whether it's on YouTube, podcast, however you're taking in the show, it is much appreciated. And uh, we are grateful here that you are making us at Lockdown Grizzlies a part of your Memphis Grizzlies experience. I am Joe Mullinex, one of the hosts of this program, joined almost as always by the illustrious DeMichael Cole. How are you doing on this fine podcast uh, recording? I, I, I do have to say that even when the Grizzlies are off, it seems like you're working pretty hard, DeMichael. You got to tell the commercial appeal to, to relax a little bit. You know, uh, this team, I mean, it's, it's the team. I mean, no one told John Moran and Desmond Bain to go out here and set a franchise record and it's score true. 38 points apiece. So, you know, when historic things happen, you it causes for long work days for, for, for people like myself. But uh, I like the new adjective you use there, uh, illustrious. That's that's a new one. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. But I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, things are great. The Grizzlies, I mean, uh, three and one start to the NBA season. Joe, we talked a lot about how they had to take advantage of this early season schedule. And so far, so good. They're doing exactly what they need to do. Right. I think that's an important thing to point out. And on this episode, we're going to be critical a little bit in some spots to Michael. We're going to talk about some areas of weakness with the team four games in. But I want to just set some ground rules here. All right. In terms of surprises, there's good surprises and bad surprises uh, with this Grizzlies team. First off, they've played four games. Everybody needs to relax. All right. Like in terms of being upset about what DeMichael and I are about to say, all of this can change over the longer span of the life of a season. So even the good can become bad and the bad can become good. These are just takeaways from our first four games out with this Grizzlies team. And another thing I want to point out or remind everyone of, and chances are if you're listening or watching, you, dear listener, dear viewer, you understand that the Grizzlies are not at full strength. When Jaron Jackson Jr. is back, when Zaire Williams is back, Dylan Brooks has more than just one game under his belt. The Memphis Grizzlies, some of this stuff we're about to discuss, is going to look vastly different. But before we get to the negative, the, the constructive criticism, maybe is a better way to put it to Michael, I have basketball reference pulled up in front of me. And I noticed in research for this episode uh, some areas of positivity, things that the Grizzlies and their fan base should be excited about four games into the season. And the first one actually very closely aligns with something that you have said up and down and all around, either here on Lockdown Grizzlies or over at the Commercial Appeal as the Memphis Grizzlies beat writer, a major area of focus for you was shooting. The Grizzlies, as of this recording, are third in the National Basketball Association in three-point shots made. They are sixth in three-point shots attempted, at 39.8, almost 40 a game, and they are 10th at 38.4% in terms of three-point conversion percentage. DeMichael, for me, that is arguably reason number one the Grizzlies have been able to withstand this early onslaught 
the only game they've lost, you could argue, is the game they should have lost to the New York Knicks. They've held serve basically in every other game that they should have been favored or were close to favored. Maybe the Brooklyn Nets game, you could say, was a bit of a toss-up. But they beat the Knicks. They beat the Rockets. They beat the Nets at home in large part because of them doing what you have said they have to do, be a threat from beyond the arc. Yeah. And, you know, they had this mentality. They said, Mm -hmm. we're going to shoot more three-pointers this year. This was Taylor Taylor Jenkins' message. Uh, He wanted the team to focus more on three-point shooting and inside the paint. You know, less less of those floaters, you know, less of the mid-range jumpers and things like that. More of the three pointers, and lo and behold, you have guys like John Conchar, uh, Desmond Bain shooting a lot of three pointers. John Morant, how about John Morant? 60 percent from three point range, probably not sustainable, (laughs) probably not, probably not, unless he's the greatest of all time. (laughs) Santi Aldama, you know, shooting it from three point range. You have a lot of guys chipping into this as well, so the shooting has been impressive. And it's not the mate, it's not just the mates, it's the attempts. You know, they're shooting it. You know, we talked last uh last year when they went into that Timberwolves series. A lot of the talk was about how Minnesota shoots so many more three-pointers than the Grizzlies. So they could go 14 of 40, and the Grizzlies would go eight of 20. Mm-hmm. And they'd have this big gap in three-point you know, made, and, and that's a big gap in point differential overall. And I think the Grizzlies are kind of, you know, realizing that at the end of the day, you're going to have to shoot a lot of three-pointers. It's it's analytics, but it's also, it's modern NBA. You know, everyone is growing up shooting the basketball now, and they're doing a good job of it, Joe. Thanks a lot, Steph Curry, for ruining the game of basketball. Get off my lawn, Clay Thompson, with all of this long-range shooting and glorifying not getting to the basket. I want to go back to the 1980s when basketball was football and football was collisions and car accidents. That's what I want to see. I'm being facetious for those of you that aren't watching. I'm being sarcastic. Uh, I do think that a lot of that is a half truth, right? Obviously, the Warriors have had some tremendous success, professional sports and sports in general. A lot of copycat stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You see the Golden State effect being or permeating throughout the NBA, and now we're going to have Warriors fans in our uh, comments and mentions uh, talking about you know how they're light years ahead of everybody. Um, but I digress. I, I do think that the three-point shooting is a major reason they've been able to hold serve to this point, even with the injury issues they've had. Another thing that I think is even more important to Michael, because I think it's more sustainable, as we mentioned, John Morant shooting 60% from three, probably not sustainable. John Morant Uh, per game, being in a position to get to the free throw line almost 11 times a game, very much sustainable. The Grizzlies team as a whole has attempted 107 free throws to this point. That is good for seventh in the National Basketball Association. On a per game rate, John Morant is pacing the team at uh, 10.8 free throws attempted. The next closest guy is Desmond Bain at 3.5. But if you put it to per 100 possessions to Michael, Obviously, Jaw 15.6, Brandon Clark 17, or excuse me, 7.2. You are seeing that the team is making a commitment, especially Jaw, to getting to the basket and searching for contact. I'm not going to advocate for Jaw Morant becoming James Harden uh, of the Houston Rockets when he would go and, you know, slow down games to a crawl because he was out seeking out contact, taking 16 free throws a game making 15 of them on a night-in, night-out basis. However, there is value when you are able to get to the rim as effectively as John Morant in creating contact, smart contact, and getting to the charity stripe and taking those easy buckets. Morant's conversion rate may not be sustainable. Him being aggressive in the right way without putting his body in jeopardy is very much sustainable, and I hope that continues. The free throw attempts with Jaw leading the pace – that is what I'm most excited about. The three-point shooting's great, but like I said, I feel like that's going to curve a little bit. They can keep getting to the charity stripe, to Michael. Uh, uh, they're going to keep doing that, and and are they going to keep doing it at this rate? We'll we'll discuss that at a later time. But John Morant, right now, ten point eight free throw attempts per game, second in the NBA. He leads the NBA right now 
He is the NBA leader in free throws made per game right now at 9.3 made free That's throws amazing. per game. Yeah, it's so amazing that it's more than one free throw made per game higher than anyone else in the association. So, uh, I mean, you're talking about a guy who's clearing 50% from the field, who's clearing 40% from three-point range, and right now he's at 86% from the free throw line. So we're talking Kevin Durant, Steve Nash, Larry Bird uh, type efficiency 50, almost. 50, 40, 90. Yeah, yeah, he's flirting. He's flirting with it. But uh, it's not just John. It's the team. It's this, again, it's this mindset of we're going to attack the rim and we're going to force the issue. Desmond Bain, no one has ever seen Desmond Bain in a Grizzlies uniform attack the rim like this. Go back right. to this this game, you know, against the Nets. You know, he makes eight three-pointers. That's 24 of his points. But he also has 14 other points where he's aggressive getting to the line. We saw left-handed finishes from Desmond Bain. How many times have you seen that? At the rim, we saw right handed finishes. We saw him, I mean, just put in the issue. He has this big frame. Guess what? He used it and he used it in the preseason. It's definitely a, a renewed sight. And before I uh, close out on this point, how about John Morant? He's starting to get those superstar calls. Yeah. You know, I remember in the past, Joe, mm -hmm. it was like you, in the NBA, there's this thought that you have to earn it. You, you got to pay your, your, your respects, pay your dues. And John Morant's starting to get some of those calls, not necessarily fouls that aren't fouls, but the fact that he has so much respect when he goes to the rim, the referees are almost anticipating the contact, whereas in the past, you don't get that respect. So he's he's getting that respect now. And, and I mean, it's not even James Harden from, with him from the free throw line. Right. I think it's more Giannis. I think people mm -hmm. just have to foul him, you know, because he's going to go up over you or he's going to go through you. And his three-point shooting, if he's able to maintain, obviously he's not going to shoot 60%. If he can stay around 36%, 37%, that's massive for his mm -hmm. game in terms of having to honor him going over screens and, as you alluded to, I think the Giannis comp is better than James Harden. I agree. You, you, There's no other option. You're going to be a step behind. You're going to be off on your angle, and you're going to have to make a kind of contact that you don't necessarily want to. So shout out to Superstar Calls. Shout out to earning the respect of officials. Shout out to getting the job done. Speaking of getting the job done, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's extremely easy in my own experience checking out LinkedIn jobs. So much can be found in terms of hiring stories, success stories, positive experiences that all add up to this service being well worth your time. It's extremely easy to create a free job post over on LinkedIn jobs. You add your job with the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. This has been a tough close to the year here in 2022. Everybody's trying to figure out how to get the year done right, how to get things done in a strong manner. The right team member can help you do just that. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We talked about some positive surprises, the free throw attempts, the three point shooting. Those are all things that are helping the Grizzlies stay afloat. Now, it's time for some Debbie Downer music. Insert uh, some womp, womp, sad trombone perspective here to Michael. There are some things that are surprising with the Grizzlies that are not good. And I think the one that a lot of folks have mentioned is the defense, right? They are struggling mightily on the defensive end of the floor. In fact, they are currently, in terms of defensive rating, 28th in the National Basketball Association. I don't know if you know this or not, to Michael. Expansion hasn't happened yet. There's still only 30 teams in the NBA. So that means they are uh, close to dead last yeah. in the NBA in defensive rating. They are having a strong offensive season, 
But yeah. when you think of Grizzlies basketball these last couple of yeah. years, not what you're used to, not what you really think about. You you think highlight plays, you think transition defense opportunities, you think the getting out and moving and trying to create turning defense into offense. That has not happened to this point. And there are reasons for that, right? First and foremost, mm-hmm. health. Dylan Brooks, the best perimeter defender on the team, just made his season debut on Monday night against Brooklyn. Jaron Jackson Jr., still out. Uh, Zaire Williams, not necessarily a, a player with a defensive pedigree, but he has a frame and a size at six foot nine, the lateral movement. He can play on the perimeter and defend other guards, other forwards. He's not a combo forward like we've talked about before. He's a perimeter guy. He is a true one, two, or three before he would be a stretch four. That size holds value. That athleticism holds value. And when you're down all three of those guys, rotations are going to be off. Rim protection opportunities are going to be slow to manifest. And you're going to see some struggles. So I think that most folks wouldn't be surprised that there have been some issues on that end of the floor with so much talent out for the Grizzlies at this moment that is currently uh, the the strength of their game is defense, like Jaron Jackson Jr., for example. But I do think it's surprising that they have been this bad. Again, I would not have put them at 28th in the NBA to start this season, Michael. Yeah, and they've had games where they just weren't stopping guys. You know, Mm -hmm. Houston. Most of that game, they got it right in the fourth quarter. But most of that game, they they weren't stopping Houston. And then the Mavs game, of course, uh, there was no stopping uh, Dallas in that game. And it, even in this past game, okay, it's Katie and Kyrie. You know, they're going to do that. But still, they scored 124 points. But to take the issue a step further uh, past the scoring, mm-hmm. the thing is, if you look at this Grizzlies team, 6.3 steals per game right now. Mm. Uh I don't know how familiar you people are with the exact numbers, but the Grizzlies last season averaged over nine steals per game. They were talking three steals less. Uh, you know why? There's no DeAnthony Melton. There's no Kyle Anderson. Be easy now. You bring up DeAnthony Melton, you know, folks might start to ask how he's doing in Philly. Yeah, uh, but uh, but we're, we're talking about the Grizzlies system correct. and how, you know, uh, how he applied here. You know, it it in in Philly. I mean, it's it's you're playing. He's playing with James Harden and, and Joel Embiid. It's a, it's a whole different ball game. But mm-hmm. uh, to the point here, there are some differences. Now you're relying on guys like John Morant to be more active. And he did have two steals in this past game defensively. Desmond Bain, uh, and these guys haven't been big just turnover generators uh, to this point in their careers. So you wondered how the defensive identity would shift or change. And you still, you know, you mentioned the biggest caveat there is Jaron Jackson Jr. and Dylan Brooks have been out. Dylan Brooks is not going to help you as much in the skills uh, compartment, but he he's really going to help you from the standpoint of he's going to lock down someone. He's going to help you out in that. Uh, and if you don't believe me, go back to that Nets game. I went back and rewatched it. You know what I found, Joe? Dylan Brooks in that third quarter, he played up until the 624 mark of the third quarter. In that stretch from the 12 minute to the 624 mark, Kevin Durant scored two points. Ooh. From 624 to the end of the quarter, Kevin Durant scored 15 points. While Dylan Seems relevant. Bench. It's very relevant. <laughs> 21 of his 37 came while Dylan Brooks was on the bench. So you, you have to factor that in because everyone's like, oh, Dylan Brooks isn't that big of a difference. Uh, Kevin Durant scores 37. Yeah, Dylan Brooks also in his first game back only played 24 minutes because he was on a restriction. So I think the defensive potential is still there, you know, because Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr., Zaire Williams, those are three big pieces to your defense. But the thing is, what's going to be the identity? Uh, It can't – It's well, it could be, theoretically speaking, but it's looking like it's not going to be the stocks, the steals and blocks. Um, leading to all the transition opportunities. It looks like they're going to have to just continue to rebound the ball at a high level, and they're going to have to push and transition to create those opportunities more than in the past. 6.3 steals, 22nd in the NBA right now. We're used to the Grizzlies being first to second, 22nd in the NBA in steals, and I think that reflects directly on that uh, 28th ranking that you mentioned earlier. 
And I think it also is a direct reflection of what we're going to talk about in our final segment uh, in terms of the depth. You alluded to it a little bit with Kyle Anderson and DeAnthony Melton. He yeah. who shall not be named. Um, <laughs> but when you have so many players out due to injury, when you lose two veterans like that, even if you want to say they're, they were your ninth and tenth best players, which maybe that's true, especially in the playoffs, that doesn't change the fact that they were important to the regular season and how the team had success. Doesn't mean that they can't continue to have success, that they can't change how they score. I think there's early evidence to suggest that they have done that. The free throw attempts up 20% in terms of three pointers attempted. There is evidence that they are making those moves to adjust how they're going to put those points on the basket or in the basket. But I, I do want to remind people that injuries plus free agency and trades equals a bench that perhaps is being asked to do a little more than they're ready to do. But we'll talk more about that in our last segment of the show. Before we get to that, thank you for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. These are the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. These is uh, uh, excuse me, Locked On Sports Today is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. I also want to give a shout out to Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for betting basketball, football. As the NBA season gets underway, make sure you're making betonline.net part of your everyday consumption of the NBA. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in depth analysis on every game. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today and you or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. When we come back, we will finish out the show talking about another area of surprise, and I killed the lead a little bit there. Uh, when you are down players, it puts people in positions that maybe they're not comfortable being in. That's starting to show itself a little bit early in the season for the Memphis Grizzlies. We'll talk about that next here on Locked on Grizzlies. Welcome back to Locked on Grizzlies. Before we get into our final segment, I do want to shout out our title sponsor, on this episode, Bet Online. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. DeMichael, no Demi or no uh, DeAnthony Melton, no Kyle Anderson, no Dylan Brooks until recently, no Jaron Jackson Jr., no Zaire Williams. That is literally half of the rotation from last year's team not there at the moment, or at least not until recently with Dylan Brooks for the Grizzlies. So obviously you still got Tyus Jones, still got Brandon Clark, John Morant, duh, Desmond Bain, duh, Steven Adams. But you're replacing those other five guys with players that aren't necessarily thriving in the here and now. Uh, David Roddy, for example, four games into his uh, rookie campaign, shooting 27.6% from the floor, shooting – 13% from beyond the arc. It's not great. That's not the kind of numbers you want to see. Uh, in terms of defensive rating, we mentioned in the previous segment, uh, the issues defensively, you've got guys like David Roddy. He has the fourth worst defensive rating in the entire among all of the current players that have played at least 50 minutes this season. You have Jake LaRavia that's in that mix. And in fairness to LaRavia, he's tied with Desmond Bain, Brandon Clark. Uh, Santi Aldama has done some good things. But we can focus specifically on the rookies. And this, this kind of brings us back full circle to conversations that we've had in the past about my level of concern about this team being a contender that doesn't act like a contender, right? Like Eric Gordon is having memes created on a nightly basis, essentially, with the Houston Rockets. Very unhappy. Please, someone save Eric Gordon. Are you trying to tell me that Eric Gordon wouldn't make the Memphis Grizzlies better? Because I think he would. Oh, we have some expiring contracts that can maybe facilitate such a deal. Maybe the Houston Rockets don't need draft capital because they just want to get off of Eric Gordon's contract. That conversation could be had. 
but we have a baseline there and that would mean less David Roddy. That would mean less Jake LaRavia, not because they aren't capable of doing it, but because they are rookies that are being asked to do things that maybe they're not ready to do for a contender level team. I'm not advocating for an Eric Gordon trade. I'm using that as an example of this team has not made it a priority to supplement game ready veteran presence on the floor. And I think that when you have injury concerns that rears its ugly head and it's doing that right now for Memphis. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not what people around here are used to. Uh, right now, the bench has been a negative in yep. the first four games of the season. And it's not just that. Uh, take it a step further. I talk all the time about Taylor Jenkins' rotations. Ten men. He, he loves to go with a ten-man rotation. Well, if mm -hmm. you watch uh, the two games after the season over against the Knicks, kind of looked like nine. Uh, Xavier Tillman was the tenth man in uh, the game after the Knicks game, and he had a very small role. And then against the Rockets, they went all out. You know, I mean, against the Mavs, it, it was nine-man rotation. Mm -hmm. So with all that being said, the thing is uh, they were pretty much nine men until Dylan Brooks got back. Dylan Brooks came back. Now you're going back to a 10-man rotation. And I think the bench, you know, they outscored the Nets bench in this, in this last game and had an encouraging – you know, performance. Brandon Clark, 13 points. They were still an overall net negative. And Brandon Clark still, you know, we're used to seeing Brandon Clark close games. Well, right now, Steven Adams is getting the nod in closing game situations, which wasn't the case last season because you had Jaron Jackson Jr. playing alongside Brandon Clark, which a lot of people like to talk about. A lot of people have made the point to me, hey, DeMichael, Brandon Clark likes playing alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. So you know what I did? I went back and looked at the number one, went back and watched some games from a couple years ago. And yeah, I see it. He does play better alongside Jaron Jackson, but guess what? Jaron Jackson Jr. ain't here right now. Right. And you just paid Brandon Clark a whole lot of money to play well, regardless of who's on the floor. So uh, at the end of the day, that's what has to happen. And, man, in two months, we're going to be talking about how good this bench is, I believe. Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be Tyus Jones, John Conchar, Zaire Williams, Santi Aldama, I mean, he to me, he looks like a full-blown starter right now. And he's going to be coming off the bench uh, very soon. And then Brandon Clark, uh, very interested to see those Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark pairings uh, going forward. And then you have Jaron Jackson Jr., uh, who should be getting close to five on five very soon. And then, you know, Steven Adams. So uh, things are looking up, but right now, they aren't up. Um, the, the bench is struggling. Uh, people talk about the lack of shot creation. I think Zaire Williams can help you there. And at the end of the day, the Grizzlies like to stagger their guys. If you watch after the first six, seven, eight minutes of the game, John Morant or Desmond Bain uh, typically are in the game for large portions of the game. And then Dylan Brooks will now factor into that as well. When you look at this team, DeMichael, because obviously you follow them very closely. You're there on the ground in Memphis following – along at practices how do you see this team's rotation once they're healthy right I, I think we can agree it's going to be Jones Conchar Williams Aldama Clark that seems the most likely true second unit LaRavia Roddy does that put them in a position where you start seeing them get some run with the Memphis hustle are they going to stay up and be parts of the Grizzlies is going to be kind of an in-between floating. I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here mm -hmm. with some prognostication. Again, I'm not giving up on David Roddy. I'm not giving up on Jake LaRavia, who you and I have talked about how that jumper looked pretty sweet. We weren't worried about his poor summer league performance. We're looking pretty smart right now. He's shooting 54% from beyond the arc. So he's probably not going to maintain that shot percentage, but I think 38, 39, 40% is very realistic for LaRavia moving forward. Um, do you see them kind of fitting into that half hustle, half Grizzlies role, and they get a chance, much like Zaire Williams did, maybe not through injury, but the next time we see them because of injury, whatever the case might be in terms of getting more minutes in February and March, they're more primed and ready, especially Roddy when their number is called. Yeah, I think it's different with those guys. They're not in a Santi Aldama a situation, I don't think. Is you have the two examples. You have Zaire Williams from last season. You have Santi Aldama. Different perspectives. With Zaire Williams, 
You had a guy last season who got a chance early, like these guys are, struggled very badly. And, you know, through injury, through COVID health and safety protocols, he got time to dive into film, sat on the bench, came back in January, and from February on looked like a completely different player. Mm -hmm. That's one example. Santi Aldama, a little bit different. Got a guy came up, uh, played sparingly, sent them down to the hustle where he played, you know, around 20 or so games and got a lot of time down there. And that was his, you know, method of uh, uh, to get better. So you have those two examples. I think it's going to be more Zaire Williams with those two guys in particular because they're getting – they're learning on the job right now. So the minutes to, oh, let's keep them fresh and getting them on the court – uh, that's not going to be as important with those guys as these Kennedy Chandler or Vince Williams or Kemp Lofton Jr. because they're getting it right now. They're playing, and they're playing good big minutes. So that's going to be good for them to sit down, say, hey, watch Dylan Brooks. Watch mm -hmm. Zaire Williams on the same – you know, watch what he does on the play where you did this instead of doing this. Watch how Zaire, Zaire Williams does it. Watch how Desmond Bain – you know, does this or watch Jaron Jackson Jr.'s uh, defensive, you know, versatility here and there. And that's going to, you know, help them. Zaire Williams is the perfect case in point. He played early in the season, did not do well, yeah. got the time. And he he tells, he said it all the time. Those mental reps were glowing for, for Zaire Williams. I think it'll be the same for those guys because you, you see it. Sometimes they're just sped up. And you see, you, you mentioned it with Jake Laravia, the stroke is, oh, my. God, uh, Joe, I watched him shoot around before uh, the last game. And when I tell you every shot was hitting the bottom of the net, <laughs> it was I, I asked him after. I was like, is that the best shoot around you've had? Because there is no way he could consistently like it was some Steph Curry type stuff. I'm not <laughs> even over exaggerating here. And he said, yeah, that was probably my best shoot around because I mean, he wasn't missing. You see the stroke there with Jake Laravia, and it's just. Imagine when the game slows down for him and, and he knows how fast guys are going to close out. He knows, oh, this defender is this long. This defender is this slow. This defender is this fast. The results are going to yield themselves throughout those opportunities. But it's going to be great for them, Joe, to say, sit back and, and get that opportunity behind those guys when that 10-man rotation is set and everyone's healthy. Just another reminder that it's a marathon, not a sprint with these Grizzlies. They are a title contender, but at the same time, they are set up very nicely for the long run as well. And LaRavia and Roddy figure to be a part of that over these next couple of seasons. Thanks for making Locked On Grizzlies your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. Again, from the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. The next time that we are on Locked On Grizzlies, DeMichael, we've got a roadie, the first roadie of the season. We had a Texas two-step earlier uh, there in Houston and in Dallas. But now starting with Sacramento on Thursday night, we are looking at a, I believe, a four-game West four Coast game swing. Coach. Yeah. So I have a feeling that we will be previewing that, obviously starting with the Kings, but then looking in the games ahead. Obviously an early stretch that will determine, you know, if they go two and two, one and three, three and one. Maintaining that pace of six or seven wins every ten that'll get you into a position of being a top four seed in the Western conference. That journey, uh, at least early in the season here is going to be pretty strongly determined by how they do in these next four games. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a big stretch. Uh, you, you start off with Sacramento who, who's winless, but they're hungry and they have mm -hmm. talent. They uh, want Sacramento. to win. Yeah. Sacramento is, is definitely vying for a playoff spot. This isn't the old Sacramento things we've seen the past uh, 10, 15 plus years that haven't done much. These guys want to mm -hmm. win. So don't can't overlook them. Then you have, you know, two games against the Utah Jazz team that quite frankly, not, not the tanking. Most yeah, not the not most talented team in the world, but they're not playing like they want Victor win by right. Yana, if you know what I mean. So uh some really games on if you look at it, oh Grizzly should win those games, but can't overlook these teams. Two games in Utah and that altitude. You, 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 you never know. I, I remember last season talking to the Grizzlies players after those games every now and then. They would mention, oh, the altitude and things like that. So there is an adjustment factor there. And uh, I think I think overall they will do well on this road trip. But it's, it's a big one, uh, not necessarily in terms of 
you know, it's big for the standings. It's just a big establishing point. If the Grizzlies dominate this part of the schedule before Jaron Jackson Jr. comes back, we're talking about potentially a one seed type team here, Joe. Like this, this is. I mean, there's no way uh, to, to to. There's no other way to put it. If the Grizzlies control this early part of the schedule before the big boys come, um, when you have three games against the Mavs in the second half of the season, uh, you don't play Golden State until you know December. I think you don't play Phoenix until the end of December. Mm-hmm. If Jaron Jackson Jr. gets back before that stretch and you're playing well now, they're setting themselves up pretty good. Absolutely. They're in a strong position to build upon early season success and improve upon some of the areas that we talked about on this episode. We'll look into that and more with the upcoming schedule on the next Locked on Grizzlies podcast. But until that time, for DeMichael Cole of the Memphis Commercial Appeal, I'm Joe Mullinax. Thank you so much for joining us. Continue to rate, review, subscribe. Make us a part of your Grizzlies experience each and every day. We are appreciative of that opportunity, and we look forward to the next time. Until then, I'm Joe. He's DeMichael. Stay locked in, Grizzlies folks and fans. This is Locked On Grizzlies.